Let's get the water back into the boiler. There's a lot of different ways we can do this. Let's talk about it, getting it back. First, we got that over popular A dimension, the 28 inches, simple as can be. The gravity, the weight of the water in the, in the pipe is going to make the water go back into the boiler. But you got to make sure that you have at least 28 inches, preferably more if you can, between the center of the gauge glass and the bottom of that lowest horizontal steam carrying pipe. That's why boilers wind up in pits. This guy took the boiler out of the pit, got severe water hammer, called me up, went and took a look. I said, why did you take the boiler out of the pit? He says, I couldn't figure out why it was down there. He says, what am I supposed to do now? So I said, well, I guess you either have to put the boiler back in the pit or you have to invest in a boiler feed pump and some steam traps because you don't have enough A dimension. And he says, who's supposed to pay for that? And I said, you are. And he said, why should I pay for it? I didn't know. I said, well, that's why you should pay for it, because you didn't know. And he says, well, how do you figure that? I said, well, that's called tuition. Now, here are motorized valves, which I really despise, because they cause all kinds of problems. Motorized valves are often sold to churches and places like that, where there's not a lot of money, and there's a lot of steam, and there's a lot of problems. And the idea is, well, why heat the whole place when you could heat just part of it? So here's the challenge with the motorized valves. First of all, uh, we got an A dimension over here, which is 28 inches in total. There's the main vent at the end. And uh, there's two pounds of steam pressure in the boiler. And let's say this boiler is a million BTUs. So all this piping on both sides is, is sized to accommodate and accept one million BTUs worth of steam volume at a pressure drop of about one ounce of loss for every hundred feet of travel. So that's, that's what everything wide open before the motorized valves are added, which they were never there in the beginning. So now we got a motorized valve and somebody comes along and closes that. So ask yourself the question, when somebody closes that, who changes the size of the boiler from 1 million BTUs to 1 half million BTUs, since that's all we need? And the answer is nobody does. So the boiler continues to produce 1 million BTUs and we're now trying to put 10 pounds in a five pound bag. And since it's a gas, you could do that. But you can't do that at a pressure drop of one ounce of loss for every 100 feet of travel. What suffers is the pressure drop. It gets tremendously higher. So instead of having that leftover steam pressure out the end, you're going to have less pressure and you're going to get water hammer over here when the boiler is running on the one zone. Meanwhile, over here, you got zero PSI over here because the, because the motorized valve is closed. So the zero PSI, and this is open to the atmosphere. That's a main vent. Two pounds of pressure in the boiler. No pressure in this pipe. So I would imagine that the pressure in the boiler is going to just shove the water up this line, completely fill the main when that motorized valve is closed. It's going to flood it right back to the valve, right? Okay, so now imagine what happens when that valve opens and Mr. Steam meets Mr. Water in this horizontal pipe. Right. You're going to get water hammer that's going to lift the church off its foundation and hammer like crazy, and it's going to take all that water back into the boiler, which has been getting replenished by an automatic water feeder and suddenly your boiler is flooded right up to the top of the header. Somebody has to go downstairs because now you can't make steam and drain the boiler back to here and they'll do this every single day of the winter spending money on water, on chemicals, on damaged sections. I mean it's, it, it never ends. Because keep in mind over here once this valve closes this becomes a B dimension and you need 28 or 30 inches of vertical height for every PSI pressure. We don't have it. Condensate pump is a great way to return water to the boiler if the boiler doesn't mind getting it. So we've got a float that goes up and turns the pump on and the water comes out and the float goes down and the pump goes off. So it is not asking the boiler whether it needs this, it's just sending it on its way. So in some cases, the boiler feed pump is a better choice because this does not have the float inside of it. It's got the pump here and it's got an oversized receiver to accommodate all the water that's coming back. The, that's not going to go back into the boiler. It waits here in reserve. And on the boiler, we've got a float operated pump controller. Here's an older one that's operating on a mercury switch, which we're not allowed to use anymore for good reason. And nowadays, you probably see probe type with this be pump on, pump off, two probes like this. That's more likely. And now if we have a motorized valve on here, consider this. Now, there's your condensate pump, or your pump controller in this case is, is operating a boiler feed pump, I apologize. And there's two pounds of pressure in the boiler, and you got zone valves over here, the motorized valves, and they both close. So now they're both shut. Think about what happens next. 
There's steam in the boiler, there's steam in this pipe, and there's steam in these pipes here. So as soon as the motorized valve shut and the boiler burner shuts off, all of this is going to condense and you're going to get a very deep vacuum inside the boiler, inside the header, and in the pipes up to the motorized valves. As soon as you get the vacuum forming there, air is going to enter the vent line of the condensate pump, push the water that's in the, I mean the boiler feed pump, push the water in the boiler feed pump through the check valve and flood the boiler. And this happens so fast that if you're watching the gauge glass at the moment it happens, you'll swear somebody opened a fire hose to fill that boiler. The water will just rush right to the top of the gauge glass, continue to flood into the boiler and go right up into the header. Very common problem and the solution is to get a vacuum breaker somewhere here above the water line to break the vacuum that's being formed when these things close down. Again, it's common sense, but it's often missed. It's often missed with the vacuum pumps as well. And I told you about these earlier and how they work in bigger buildings, but let's say we're putting in a new boiler and it's smaller than the old boiler. So we want to add to the mix a boiler feed pump. So in this case, we've got the vacuum pump, which comes on with the burner to pull a vacuum through all these pipes and the vacuum gets pulled right back to the surface of the water. So we got vacuum in the boiler. The condensate comes, the vacuum pump dumps the returning condensate into the boiler feed pump, which is vented to the atmosphere, and the boiler feed pump pumps it into the boiler, but only when the pump controller calls for it. But consider this for a minute. The vacuum pump is creating a vacuum inside the boiler above the water line. The boiler feed pump is vented to the atmosphere. So as soon as this begins to go to vacuum, the atmospheric pressure is going to take the water in the boiler feed pump, shove it through the check valve, and flood the boiler. And again, it's a very common problem. And the way around that is on this application where you have to have a vacuum pump and a boiler feed pump, don't use a check valve here. Instead, use a motorized valve on that feed line. So then you take your pump controller and you wire it to the motorized valve. And the motorized valve has an end switch that starts and stops the boiler feed pump. And that's the way around that problem of the flooding when you've got a boiler feed pump combined with a vacuum pump.